Okay, so good morning, everyone. I mean, um, once again, I want to thank the organizers, Professor Kawashima, for this invitation and for the opportunity to be here again. It's always a pleasure to come back to the ISSP. As I said yesterday, it was the first place that I visited in Japan. And, and, and Professor Kawashima asked me uh, to, to talk about something that connects experiments, or at least that you know is, is a theoretical effort, but that was motivated by experimental work, by, by collaboration with experimentalists. So I decided to talk about this kind of old problem, which is the dynamical structure factor of the triangular Heisenberg planet. Uh, we will see that you know although the problem is old, I think it is still open. Um, and, and while the static properties of, of the ground state of the triangular Heisenberg magnet and the magnet are, are very well understood, I would say by now, the dynamical properties are still far from being understood. And you know, nowadays that you know there is this increasing interest in uh, finding quantum spin liquids. Um, I think that you know triangular lattice systems you know can play an interesting role in the sense that uh, we can probably see some indications of pre-fractionalization, so like proximity to quantum spin liquid states by analyzing the excitation spectrum of, of systems that are not far from a so-called quantum melting point. Right? So what we know, at least from the huge experimental effort from our colleagues, is that it is not that easy to, to find spin liquids in nature. But in the meantime, uh, we are finding an increasing an increasing number of materials that do order magnetically, but it is not easy at all to, to reproduce the dynamical spin structure factor to un understand the excitations of those materials that do order magnetically, but you know, we are fine. And, and while this is a workshop uh, oriented to computational methods, you know, today we'll talk more like as an a, about an analytical approach that we are using, but you know, with the hope that this will also trigger the interest in many of you in, in, in developing, you know, uh, keep developing computational methods mainly for computing dynamical response of, you know, fluctuated magnets. Because I think it's, it's something that is extremely important right now uh, in order to, to understand, to start understanding, you know, this, uh, how this fractionalization, what are the fingerprints of fractionalization of the excitations in the, in the dynamical response. So, so this is work that you know we did, uh, we are doing actually in collaboration with uh, several people. And on the on the theory front, you know, you heard yesterday a very nice presentation by Camilla San. He's uh, right now a professor at the Jiaotong University in Shanghai. Uh, when we started with this, he was still a postdoc in Los Alamos. And uh, then uh, Shan Xiongshang is a postdoc at the University of Tennessee. And then there is this group of friends and collaborators from my country of origin, from Argentina. Uh, they are in a place called Rosario in Argentina. And um, these uh, two guys are, are PhD students. You know, this one is graduating, Esteban Jolly and Marti Matias Gonzalez. And uh, this is Luis Manuel and Adolfo Trumper. That you know, they are um, two scientists that here you know, have been working on these large, large methods, you know, for, for a while, for many years. And you know, finally we join forces, and you know, we are trying to make some progress, uh, you know, the, the kind of progress that they will describe today. And then there is a long list of experimentalists, uh, many of them working in the neutron scattering facility. Actually, I should have said that, you know, I, have, I work in both places. I mean, this is the University of Tennessee. This is uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And uh, right here in this building is where they do, I mean, these neutron scattering experiments. It's a simulation neutron source. And there is this little building here, which is the interface in between the university and the laboratory. So there is where you know the theories we are hiding and trying to explain <laughs> what is <laughs> happening in this <laughs> big building. So and actually, you know, uh, we have a visitor program, so you are more than welcome to visit us. And in particular, if you have interest in, in collaborating with, with experimental effort from, from the neutron, from the spallation neutron source. So, so many of these uh, experimentalists and neutron scattering experts that you know were involved in this work. Um, then um, we also collaborated with uh, the NMR group of uh, Stuart Brown in UCLA, 
so you will see some experiments from them as well. And what I will do is, in the first 30 minutes of the talk, I will describe briefly what, uh, what was the experimental work that somehow motivated what they will explain uh, in the last, in, 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 during the main part of the lecture. So, um, so the, the, the main motivation, I would say, I, I would say is, is, is to understand the origin of you know, the quantum, the strong quantum effects that are revealed you know, by the excitation spectrum of magnetically ordered states. What we will see is that you know, even magnetically ordered states that you know, at first sight seem like you know, they can be well described with semi-classical approaches, uh, they, they may support you know, excitations that are highly non-classical. But that, that will be one of the messages of this uh, lecture. And then, if that is the case, the question is, how do we address that problem? How do we explain if, if the semi-classical methods that are pretty much all we have on the analytical front do not work? You know, what can we do right, to try to understand these anomalous excitations produced by strong quantum fluctuations? So, and in particular, to illustrate this problem, I will focus on a particular material the, on the static and dynamical properties of you know, the triangular lattice and the photomagnet. Uh, you know, this, this particular material is a coal based magnet that I will describe in a moment. Yoshi was describing that yesterday. And, um, and, and actually, believe it or not, you know, it is not easy to find materials that you, know, you can make a single crystal, they are good. I mean, they, 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 they comprise equilateral triangular lattices you know, of spin a half or effective spin a half ions, um, and, and that, you know, they do not absorb neutrons or, you know, they do not have anything that, you know, can spoil the neutron scattering experiment. So it's actually difficult, you know, there are very few, you know, materials, believe it or not, where, you know, you can do inelastic neutron scattering in a single crystal that is a good approximation of triangular lattice and so this is one of them, and you know, this is the reason why it became very popular recently. Actually, it's very popular here in Japan, as you will see in the references. And uh, so basically, we will be analyzing you know, this dynamical spin structure factor of this material. We will see essentially that, as uh, Yoshi explained yesterday, that uh, the, a, a semi-classical approach fails completely in describing this uh, you know, S of Q and omega, the dynamical spin structure factor. And then uh, what we will propose is an alternative approach instead of a large S treatment, you know, I will show that, you know, how to use a large N treatment. Uh, we'll explain what N means in a moment um, to see if it is possible to uh, capture at least, you know, the essential features of, you know, what is observed in, in this material. So the material, uh, as I said, uh, it comprises, you know, cobalt ions, that are in a D7 configuration. That means there are seven electrons in the D shell. Uh, and effectively then, you know, there are four, five electrons in the T2G orbital. That means one hole. Uh, the hole has a spin a half. Uh, the effective orbital angular momentum is one, right? Because it's one hole in the T2G orbitals. And the coupling between our angular momentum and, and spin is anti-ferromagnetic. So you end up with a ground state doublet, right? J equal to one half, and then a J equal to three halves excited multiplet with an energy that is 200, 250 Kelvin. This gap can be measured with Newton scattering indeed. And that is much bigger than um, the, the characteristic exchange interaction between these, these doublets. So one can, in a first approximation, you know, one can safely neglect this multiplet J equal to three halves multiplet and focus on this effective spin a half degrees of freedom. And uh, what is nice about this material is that the, the lattice, the triangular lattice that is formed by these cobalt ions is equilateral, right? So unlike cesium copper chloride or some other materials that you know were discussed yesterday by Professor Hiroi, here. Uh, the, the, the system is really two-dimensional, so it's not the case. Um, you don't have this, if you want, dimensional reduction that you know, can produce effectively quasi-one-dimensional physics. Here, you really have a two-dimensional system. There are no DM interactions that is guaranteed by the crystal structure, so that's another nice aspect of this material. There is a, only a weak 
is the plane anisotropy. We will see that in a moment. Although it is weak, it has an important effect that was explained by Yoshi yesterday, um, and I, I will reiterate uh, here. You know, so once you add this easy planar isotropy, at least you know from a semi-classical point of view, you you expect that the quantum effect should be much weaker than in the isotropic model. But actually, that doesn't seem the case. So seem to be the case. So that is one of the problems with the semi-classical approach. And the other interesting aspect is that it is a quasi two-dimensional material, so the interlayer interaction is 5% of the intralayer interaction. So it, to a good approximation, you can treat it in a first approach as a two-dimensional material. Uh, then, of course, you, if you want to compare against the experiments, it is important to include the interlayer coupling, and you know, I will show the results when you include the interlayer coupling, but in a first approxima approximation, we can treat this as a two-dimensional Heisenberg magnet with a small easy plane anisotropy, and this is the G factor. I mean, the G factor is different um, along, you know, the two different directions of the in-plane. Uh, <coughs> G factor is slightly different from the perpendicular G factor. And actually, this material was studied originally here in Japan the, by this group. They measure the magnetization curve. Um, and they saw something like this, so uh, when the magnetic field is perpendicular to the C-axis, they saw a plateau, <coughs> right, a plateau phase used by the magnetic field. And then uh, they also characterized, you know, they basically from this magnetization curve, they were able to extract uh, what was, you know, <coughs> they essentially used a model and exact diagonalization to reproduce this curve, and then from those same studies, they were able to extract, you know, what were the most, I mean, the, the magnetic orderings associated with these uh, different regions in magnetic field. And something that is known in the for the triangular uh, lattice antiferromagnet at the classical level is that uh, well, if the magnetic field is zero, uh, the ground state is the so-called 120 degree ordering that is described by this, you know three arrows like this. But as soon as you put magnetic field, then uh, you have, um, you know, <coughs> not an infinite number, but, you know, you have different uh, ground states, this, you, know, uh, uh, you know, competing ground states in the sense that, you know, any state that has a given magnetization, uh, you know, such that the sum of the three spins on a given triangle has, uh, you know, one value of the magnetization is a ground state. So, for instance, you know, you could think of a state where you start canting these two spins along the field direction, so it's a coplanar state, or you could think of, you know, this state where you start canting the three spins out of the plane, that would be like more like an umbrella configuration. And at the classical level, those two states have exactly the same energy. And actually what splits that degeneracy is the quantum fluctuation. So once you add quantum fluctuation, so if, if you want in a large S approach, once you at the one, uh, once you, you, you know, you, you add the quantum fluctuations, so if you want to show <coughs> the, the spin wave Hamiltonian and, and you look at the zero point energy of the different orderings, you realize, and actually these two gentlemen realized, that the, the winners are basically this sequence of states. So for instance, at the small field, the coplanar ordering wins. Uh, then uh, there is something new that appears quant in, you know, due to quantum fluctuations, which is that this state where you have is a collinear state where you have two spins up and one spin down, basically stabilized over a finite region of magnetic fields, right? And this, this stabilization is entirely due to quantum fluctuations. So in the classical limit, one will get simply a magnetization curve that is a line, is a straight line connecting these two points. So this feature here, is entirely due to quantum fluctuations. So, so uh, similar to um, the story I think that Hugo San was describing yesterday. And, and then, uh, according to this phase diagram obtained from a large S approach, above this magnetization plateau, one gets this type of magnetic ordering, this like V shaped magnetic ordering. In the real material, you know, they see exactly <coughs> the same sequence, but actually, before the saturation, they see this kind of umbrella state, and that uh, Yoshi found out that you know is because of the interlayer interaction. So the three-dimensional 
coupling plays a role right, in the stabilization of this type of work. So I would say to, to you know, in a first, and, and this is the phase diagram, right? What I'm showing here is the phase diagram as a function of magnetic field and uh, temperature for the magnetic field perpendicular to the z-axis and parallel to the z-axis. So I will say with this kind of simple large S expansion, one can understand the main features of the quantum phase diagram. There are no, you know, no surprises here. Um, you know, the material seems to follow what was expected already from 1991. And, and actually, um, uh, one can also reproduce, you know, with the same kind of large S approach, it is possible to reproduce the NMR spectra of this material. Again, one can study uh, the phase diagram, you know, the, this NMR line as a function of magnetic field and temperature. And uh, from, from the shape of the NMR line, it is possible to also identify the type of magnetic ordering. And one can check, indeed, that, you know, we did that with Yoshi and this group uh, that, you know, that simple one over S approach uh, with the model that I described here does work really well uh, for describing also the NMR data. But the surprise appears when instead of looking at the static properties of this state, uh, we look at the excitations, so at the dynamical spin structure factor. And that was uh, basically revealed by our colleagues in Oak Ridge, that you know, they were the first ones who measure this inelastic neutron scattering um, response in, uh, in the material. And they found what uh, Yoshi was describing yesterday. They, have, they found this uh, kind of spectrum that seems to have an anomalous uh, width in the magnum peaks. So, so that means, I mean, in, when they do these experiments, there is some experimental resolution. And what they saw is that they, typically the width of, um, of the magnons is smaller than the experimental resolution, but in this particular material, it turned out that according to them, the, the width is bigger than the experimental resolution, meaning that there is some, apparently some intrinsic source of decay. These magnons are not uh, um, uh, quasi-particles that live forever. I mean, they decay after some, some time and that is reflected by, by the magnum weight. The other discrepancy, I mean, the other, not, not discrepancy, sorry, the other observation was that, you know, when uh, Yoshi did this uh, one over S expansion and went, you know, one order beyond the linear spin wave theory, uh, he found that actually when you try to fit uh, the, I mean, when you use the, the, the Hamiltonian parameters that were determined by other experiments, we find that the, the, the magnum bandwidth is significantly larger than the experimental bandwidth, you know, by a, by a, you know, by, by a large factor. And you know, that was you know, a discrepancy that was difficult to, to reconcile with the experiment. And then what actually uh, triggered you know, the biggest in interest in the material was actually that besides the, the, this discrepancy with the nonlinear spin wave approach, uh, an experiment done in Japan <coughs> that I will discuss in a moment showed that the intensity of the high frequency component, sorry, of, of the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, showed that the intensity of the high frequency com continuum is uh, anomalously, anomalously, anomalously uh, large. Uh, let me, oh, for some reason, I missed that uh, slide. Well, um, so there is a beautiful experiment of uh, Tanaka. Let me where uh, that was actually described in the in in the um, presentation by Yoshi yesterday, where uh, they show clearly that you know there is a very very uh, high intensity in the high frequency continuum that is actually bigger than the intensity you know under the magnum peaks. So that is something that you know cannot be explained with the nonlinear spin wave theory, and that really triggered our interest. So um, one one of the the things that you know when when, when you discuss this subject, you know, becomes um, uh, you know apparent is that okay. So uh, it is well known that if you take the isotropic Heisenberg model, 
uh, then the magnons can decay, right? And you know this was found originally by this group of Oleg Starik, Chubukov, and Ivanov, and simultaneously by this group of Shitominsky and Chernyshev. And, and the reason is actually very simple. So when when you have a non-collinear ordering like the 120 degree configuration, the the SO3 symmetry is completely broken, right? So, you know, we, when you have collinear ordering, there is still a residual symmetry group that is, you know, a U1 symmetry around the axis of the collinear ordering. But once you um, you, you, you have non-collinear ordering, then the, 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 the SO3 group is, is broken down to nothing. So that means that there are three Goldstone models, right? You, you are basically, according to Goldstone theorem, uh, you have you know three generators of SO3 that are no longer symmetries uh, of, 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 of the magnetically ordered state, and that means that you know you should get three Goldstone modes associated with this. Model. Now, uh, two of those Goldstone modes should have the same velocity because they correspond to rotations in the plane, right? In the plane of the magnetic ordering, and those two can be connected by the six-fold symmetry of. Of, of the plane. But one, the, the third Goldstone mode that corresponds to rotations in the axis perpendicular to the plane, that one is not connected by any symmetry to the other two, so in general it has a different velocity. Right? And the way this becomes manifest in the linear spin wave theory is that if you look at the linear spin wave spectrum, uh, at the gamma point is where you have this Goldstone mode that corresponds to rotation about the axis perpendicular to the plane. You have a higher velocity, right, of the Goldstone mode than the velocity of the other two Goldstone modes that appear one at the ordering wave vector k, and the other one at minus k. So I'm not showing it here, but you know there is another one at minus k. Those are the three Goldstone modes, right? And as I said, this one has higher velocity than the other two. So once you have that situation, a Goldstone mode that has higher velocity at the gamma point can decay into, you know, around the gamma point, can decay into two Goldstone modes, k and minus k, right, that uh, have lower velocity conserving energy and momentum, right? And that is the reason why, um, basically, even in the, if you take the hydrodynamic limit of this model, you will get that this, these magnons are broadened, right? I mean, they, they acquire a finite lifetime because through this kind of process, right, you have a magnon entering, then it decays into two magnons, then they reconnect and they come out. Uh, you know, the magnons will acquire a finite lifetime. And this is very well known. Um, and, you know, uh, one, one can understand it in this way. Here, I'm showing not, not only the single magnon dispersion, but also the onset of the two magnon continuum. And you can see that, you know, this in the minor mode is inside right, the two minor continuum. So that is what is telling you that it is possible to decay into, into two minors, right? So because of that observation, one does expect uh, large corrections. You know, when you add the one over s correction, you expect a large renormalization of the spectrum. Indeed, that is what is obtained. You know, it was obtained by, the, by both groups. You get roughly that there is a 40% renormalization of the single magnon bandwidth because of this effect. And, and also, in addition, you know, the magnons you know, can decay. But in this particular, I mean, what, what is not usually discussed is that that is a very fragile argument. Because as soon as you put any small anisotropy or you put <coughs> the layer interaction, typically you start violating these kinematic conditions. So, and in simple terms, you know, if I gap out, you know, once we put the EC axis and isotropy, now instead of uh, SO3 or AC2, I mean, we have uh, only a U1 symmetry, right? So we are, this, this mode becomes massive, right? And now, of course, it's no longer true that, you know, this mode can decay into two of these because that, you know, will, it will be impossible to conserve the energy. So somehow what happens, as you can see here, you know, you see the onset of the continuum, right now is above the single magnon dispersion. So there is no broadening, right? As soon as you put a, a small anisotropy, that broadening is gone, right? 
And, and, and a similar situation happens when, when you have a, you know, a three, you know, when you add a small interlayer interaction. And actually, that, you know, we can see that if we compare uh, the dynamical spin structure factor at these so-called endpoints, these are the endpoints of the Greenland zone. Um, so we, we can look at the, uh, you know, at the, an energy cut. So these are the two minus that appear, uh, you know, around that endpoint. And then here, right, we get basically a continuum, but you see that, you know, this magnum is overdamped, right? While when we add uh, finite, uh, so we, when we add, you know, some easy plane anisotropy, what we find is that, you know, the magnum reappears, right? And now we have a smaller intensity in the continuum. So one can see that, you know, this kind of strong quantum effect that you expect from a semi-classical point of view for the isotropic Heisenberg model, somehow, it is suppressed immediately when you put a small anisotropy. So naively, one would expect that you know once you have that kind of anisotropy, at least from a semi-classical point of view, the quantum effects should be weak. We we'll get two strong peaks. You know this this spectrum already includes the interlayer interaction and then a small uh, intensity in the continuum. Right. So good. So now, of course, when when you notice this, you know, the first reaction can be, so maybe the sample is dirty, there are a bunch of impurities, or, you know, you have, you know, spin on, uh, sorry, uh, interaction between the magnons and the lattice that are broadening, you know, these magnons, and then, you know, uh, so somehow uh, this, this theory is simply failing because, you know, you are using the wrong model, in a sense, you are using a a clean model, and uh, you know you should either include the interaction between uh, the spins and uh, and the lattice, or you should include impurities or some disorder in the exchange interactions. So the question is, you know, how do we make sure that what is being observed is intrinsic and it is not due to some extrinsic phenomenon? And what it is typically done with these systems is to increase the magnetic field, we know that if we increase the magnetic field, uh, eventually we will reach a semi-classical ground state. So that semi-classical ground state is a fully polarized state, right? And we know that for the fully polarized state, spin waves, you know, in a system like this one that has U1 symmetry, um, will be essentially exact, right? So uh, the spin wave dispersion for the fully polarized phase will give you the exact dispersion, so one having an exact uh, dispersion you can compare it with the experiment and get uh, you know the model I mean understand if indeed there is disorder or not uh, for instance there is uh, recent material based on iterbium that was discussed you know it's being discussed and you know that one is very disordered and what you see is that when you go above the saturation field uh, the magnum dispersion you know has some broadening even above the saturation field pretty big broadening, that will immediately indicate that, you know, there is this order. So here, unfortunately, it is not possible to do neutron scattering experiments uh, at above the saturation field because the saturation field is 30 tesla. So nowadays, at least, there is no facility <coughs> in the world where you can do neutron scattering, uh, you know, for that magnetic field. The maximum magnetic field, I think, is around 20 something, 25, you know, in Berlin, but they are close in that facility. So I don't really know what is the record, but you know it is impossible to reach that. So uh, as a compromise, you know what we said is well, let's go, let's apply the magnetic field and reach this phase, the up, up, down phase, um, because uh, then uh, what happens is that uh, the same quantum fluctuations that stabilize this magnetic ordering, they gap out the spectrum. So now we have a gapped uh, single magnetic spectrum. And you expect that you know quantum fluctuations should uh, have a weaker effect on the renormalization of the single magnum dispersion. And based on that observation, the experimentalists indeed that did that experiment. They went, uh, you know, they, they they increased the magnetic field and they did elastic neutron scattering uh, in this uh, region. Here, what I'm showing is that if you look at uh, you know consecutive layers 
uh, this up up down face has this characteristic that the minimum, I mean there are two spins that are pointing parallel to the field and one that is pointing anti-parallel to the field. But that one that is pointing anti-parallel to the field is alternating between the C and the V sub lattice when you go, uh, you, when you move along the C axis. So you have a kind of A, B, A, B, A, B type of structure. Uh, right, so that is a detail, but it's simply important to understand why uh, when, when, when I'm showing this comparison now between the nonlinear spin wave theory and the experiment, you know, you see that there are two, two lines here, two magnet lines, and that is precisely those two modes correspond to the fact that, you know, the unit cell is doubled right along the c-axis, so you have essentially uh, two modes you know, per, per branch. And uh, so, because it's a 120 degree ordering, I mean, you have three sides, so, I mean, the, the unit cell has three sides, right? Uh, now there is also this doubling of the unit cell, so actually it has six sides, so that is the reason why here we have six modes, right, for each wave vector. And, but you know, what is remarkable now is that, you know, with the same Hamiltonian essentially that I was showing before, now it is possible to fit perfectly well the experimental observation. So this is an indication that actually the model that we were using at zero field is probably correct, right? Uh, it's not a problem with the model, it's a problem with the approximation, right? So because the same approximation that fails at zero field works really well at about uh, 10 decibel, right? So, and, and indeed, uh, what one can do also is look at the bottom of this, the lowest energy uh, excitation um, of, 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 of these myelin branches, right? And plot that energy as a function of field, right? According to the calculation, so the, the blue line is the nonlinear spring wave theory from Yoshi, and then these points correspond to the experimental points, and one can see that, you know, again, also the theory can reproduce the field depend dependence in this region. And notice that there are two different minor branches that go soft, right, at this critical field and this critical field, right? So it's this minor branch that becomes soft here, this minor branch that becomes soft. And, and, and this is the criterion that one can use to determine what is the width of this magnetization plateau, right? So there are two critical fields where these minor branches become soft. And the reason why you have two different branches going soft is basically that if you look at the upper plot over there, you see that if you are lower in the magnetic field, uh, the up up down phase will transition into this kind of Y shape ordering, while if you are increasing the field, it, it transitions into this, this kind of V like shape ordering. Right? So that those instabilities correspond to different minor branches becoming soft. Right? So and actually this is an approach that you know in general can be used for for, for detecting, I mean for, for computing at least analytically, you know, this width of the um, of, of the plateau, right, induced by quantum fluctuations. So that's what I was mentioning to Boku Wasan yesterday from this other material. So why do we have a level repulsion only at the, I mean, one point? I mean, uh, the level repulsion near the 13 Tesla. Yeah, because in, in, in because there is some matrix element. I mean, like you know that that can connect these these, these two bands. Here. And yeah. there is no matrix element connecting other. Elements. Right. There is no in in this case. But you know what one can see is you know looking at the structure of these minor bands that you know indeed. It, these two <laughs> softenings correspond to, you know, these two different susceptibilities that are diverging. Right, so, so I didn't explain that in, in, in much detail, but the origin of this gap is, you know, comes from this one over S correction from the quantum fluctuations. And essentially, right, uh, when you put a magnetic field, the magnetic field tends to close the gap, uh, you know, both when you, lower and when, you, when you lower the magnetic field and you increase the magnetic field, so that gives you a way, a simple way of uh, this the, the width of this gap and the critical fields. And actually, let me say that you know this was originally uh, used by this group, by Jason, Alicia, and company in this paper. Uh, they introduced this method because it is not straightforward uh, to work, you know, with nonlinear spin wave theory when 
the collinear ordering is stabilized by quantum fluctuations. You have to use some sort of trick, right? Which is the trick is really you you use the the classical the, the magnetic field that corresponds to the single point in the classical phase diagram that will give you this phase. You um, then add the quantum corrections, the one over x is correction, and you realize that you know the spectrum is gapped, right? The magnum spectrum is gapped. So now you add the deviation of the magnetic field from that point, and that gap now cannot close immediately, right? It will take some critical fields to close, and that is the way in which you know it is possible to estimate these two critical fields. And actually, the agreement with experiment is, is pretty good. So you know this was also, I mean, uh, the first confirmation, I would say, that you know this kind of approach you know works pretty well for, for, for this model, right? This extension of or, or uh, generalization of, in some sense, of the large S approach. So I hope it is clear that, you know, I mean, uh, the, what I'm trying to say is that uh, it is not straightforward to, to do a, a, you know, a linear spin wave or a nonlinear spin wave approach here because if you move away from that, you know, from one particular magnetic field value, right, in the classical phase diagram, then, you know, this up, up, down ordering classically is unstable, right? So you need to use a trick in order to stabilize this. And you know, what the trick is, once again, you, you use the particular value of the magnetic field that the classical level gives you the up, 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 up down ordering. You add the quantum fluctuations, and then you put the, the difference between the real magnetic field and that value as, a, as an additional term in the, in the spin wave Hamilton. OK, so this was, for us, the confirmation that uh, experimentally, I mean, I mean that we were working with a reasonable model, and that whatever deviation is observed at zero field is not caused by extrinsic effects like impurities or phonons. And then, um, if the Hamiltonian is correct, the question, of course, and the, is, is the big question that is motivating this talk, is what do we do, right? Because we, you know, the only analytical approach that we know how to use. For, for describing you know the the dynamical response of quantum magnets is failing, right? And, and at this point is when one remembers actually that this whole story of quantum spin liquids was triggered by Anderson in 1973, who was exactly thinking of this problem, right? You know the triangular lattice and different magnet for spin one for spin one half. Uh, in his mind, you know he, he he proposed that you know probably this RBB spin liquid was the ground state of that model. Later on in the 80s, thanks to you know, variational uh, quantum Monte Carlo calculations, it was possible to demonstrate that actually the triangular lattice anti magnet orders magnetically in a 120 degree structure. So somehow it seemed like you know, Anderson was not right. But uh, of course, you know, one has to think you know, with, uh, with like, you know, an open mind. I mean, like maybe. The, the Heisenberg model with nearest neighbor interactions, you know, does not have this state as a ground state, but maybe if you add some additional uh, exchange interactions, it is possible to stabilize, you know, this kind of quantum spin liquid. And indeed, uh, there are several papers, several numerical papers, <coughs> including a recent, recent uh, DMRC study by uh, Chernyshev and, and Steve White, that show that if, if you add, indeed, a second neighbor antiferromagnetic interaction to the Heisenberg model on the triangular <coughs> lattice, it takes only 6% of the nearest neighbor interaction to have a continuous phase transition into a spin liquid whose nature is still unknown. Right? I mean, nobody knows what kind of spin liquid it is, but at least the DMRC studies are consistent with a continuous transition from the 120 degree ordering into a spin liquid state. Okay? And uh, oh, and of course, you know, one of the candidates, you know, for that spin liquid will be this Z2 uh, gap spin liquid, this RBB state, uh, that was originally proposed by Anderson, and then it was studied, you know, by several groups, including, you know, a, a well-known paper by Reed and Sachter, <coughs> and then there is also another interest, interesting paper that I will discuss in more, more detail later on in the lecture by Andrei Chu, called uh, Subir Shashtev and, and Sentil, where they analyze, you know, for what, what you know, what is the fixed point of this quantum critical point that separates 
the 120 degree ordering from a C2 gap spill. Right? So uh, when, you, when you look at this, you know, this will be more like, you know, so this parameter G here is some generic parameter. It could be, uh, as I said, the second neighbor interaction, right, in a, in a triangular high symbol magnet. But, you know, if it is true that it only takes 6% of the nearest neighbor interaction to get a transition into a spin liquid, that means that our material is on this side of the phase diagram, but near this point, right? And the question that I want to pose here is uh, when you find materials like, like, like this one or maybe some other materials that are around that are near one of these points on this side, what do we do to describe the dynamical excitations, right? Because if we treat the system as a non-interacting gas of magnums, which is what we will do if we were far away from this point, right? Uh, you know, we immediately realize that there may be a problem because the, the elementary excitations on this side are free spinons, are free spin and half particles, right? So if the transition is continuous, right, the only way we can think that, you know, this spectrum of excitation, so on the left we have magnons, on the right we have spinons, we have free spinons. So how can we connect these two pictures continuously? Well, the way we can think of this is that a magnon is a sort of bound state of two spinons. I say sort of because the number of spinons is not conserved. Right? So we shouldn't think in those simple terms, but you know, it's like a bound state of two spinons. And uh, the confinement length right, that of this bound state is increasing as we approach this point. Right? And it's actually diverging at this point. Right? So the question is, is it reasonable to, I mean, here uh, in this limit, you know, this confinement length is, is extremely short, right? So, you know, like the two spinons are on the same side. So we don't need to, I mean, we will never see, you know, these, these spinons as free or nearly free excitation. But as we approach this point, you know, the, the, the size of this ma single magnet state, you know, will become bigger and bigger. So this confinement length, you know, will be increasing. And, and, and if the confinement length is significantly larger than the lattice space, it may not be a good idea to start, you know, with a non-interacting gas of magnets and then, you know, treat the interactions perturbatively to describe the excitation spectrum of this material. So an alternative approach, which is the, the approach that I want to describe after this slide, is that one can think of the problem coming from this side. So here we know that we have free spinons, and what should happen beyond this critical <coughs> point is that, you know, this spinons, you know, should get confined from a bound state, right? And in that way, you know, we will see that, you know, the low energy modes are minus. So this is very similar to what Takafumi was describing yesterday for the quasi one dimensional materials, right? You know, every time, I mean, real materials are not strictly one dimensional, they are uh, quasi one dimensional. So normally, I mean, like if we look at very low energies and very low temperatures, we will see that there are actually magnets there. I mean, this, those systems typically order at low enough temperature. We will see that there are very low energy magnets, but the, point, the important point is that on top of that, of those low energy magnets, we see a continuum that is entirely cons consistent, you know, with the, with the uh, two spin on continuum of the perfect <laughs> one dimensional system, right? So the question here is if the continuum that, you know, is observed in this material that was shown by Yoshi yesterday, uh, uh, the, the, you know, that has a very large intensity is, is, is produced then, you know, by this kind of two-spinon continuum, and then, you know, below the continuum you have magnons that are basically uh, better described as bound states of two spinons. And, and, and if you adopt this scheme of, you know, using the non-interacting gas of spinons as the starting point and then adding the interaction between spinons perturbatively, then you will see that, you know, we end up with a gauge theory, essentially, where uh, basically the spinons interact with each other via a gauge field. And, um, and you know, the way you obtain this magnetic ordering is through a condensation of this matter field that are the spinons, that is the so-called Higgs space, right? And, and we will see that, you know, as I said, the low energy modes in that Higgs space, space you know, become, a, you know, bound states of two spinons. But Clearly, to, 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 to derive these bound states of two spinons, we have to go beyond the mean field approximation, beyond the saddle point. It's the only way this 
you know, we can get, you know, these real magnums of the theory. And that is, you know, the, the subject of this, this lecture. So how do we implement, you know, this program, right? You know, we want to attack the problem from this side. So, you know, uh, what you do in that case is, instead of using a large S approach, you use a large N approach. And one way of implementing this large N approach for this particular kind of critical point is to use uh, this Schwinger boson description where uh, now we describe each uh, spin operator in terms of bilinears in bosons that satisfy a constraint, right? I mean, for spin and half, for instance, there are only two states, up and down. So, of course, these cannot be canonical bosons. They must satisfy a constraint. And the constraint is that sim simply that the number of bosons is 2s, right? For SE2 Schwinger bosons, there are two flavors, up and down. So, for instance, if the spin is 1 half, 2s is 1, means that, you know, we should have exactly one boson in every single side. And then, uh, in, the, in the mean field, Schwinger boson approach, uh, what is typically done is you introduce these operators. This, I mean, the Hamiltonian will be, of course, uh, quartic in the, if the Hamiltonian is bilinear in the spin operator, so it is quartic in the Schwinger bosons. So uh, you need some kind of decoupling of the Hamiltonian to do a mean field. And typically, the operators that are introduced, right, for performing this decoupling are this A and B so-called A and B, these, these are the operators that are typically used for, you know, describing antiferromagnetism of collinear magnets, and this operator is used for describing ferromagnetism of collinear magnets. Now we are dealing with a non-collinear magnet, so it has both ferro and antiferro components, so it is better to keep both, right? And uh, two important comments about these operators, unlike the usual mean field theories, these operators are singlets of SU2, right? They are invariant under SU2 transformation. So when you condense these operators, you are not really breaking the symmetry of your Hamiltonian. So the symmetry will be spontaneously broken in this type of approach, unlike the usual mean field theory where you break it when you take the expectation value of an object that is not a singlet, right? I mean, an object that transforms like the order parameter. So that is the first observation. The other observation is that the creation operator, right, the dagger of this operator, uh, is an operator that creates, is creating singlets, the theory, while this operator is making them resonant, right? So in that, this kind of RBV picture, you know, you can connect this RBV picture with these operators. This one is the one that creates the singlets and this makes the singlet resonant, right? So it will move the singlets around. Okay. So now one can write the Heisenberg Hamiltonian in this way, right? Uh, this natural, and this, this, you know, leads to a natural mean field decoupling that is usually what is done for solving uh, the Schwinger boson theories at the mean field level. Again, our goal is to go beyond mean field, so we have to do something else, right? And yeah, I, I will explain that <coughs> in a moment. Uh, I, I said large n. You may be wondering what do I mean by n? But what I mean by n is that, in principle, it is possible to extend this Hamiltonian from SUN, from SU2 to SPN. Uh, so one can introduce uh, the generators of SPN. You can write the generators of SPN um, also in terms of bilinear forms, anti-symmetric combinations of generators of SUN. And and, and, you know, it is possible to formally write, the, well, the Hamiltonian will look like this now. These, again, are generators of SPN. And once again, one can find a decomposition like this one in terms of these A and B operators. Now we find, once again, uh, in terms of SPN generators. And uh, now the difference is that, you know, you have N flavors in the theory, and this is what, uh, you know, allows you to somehow uh, take formally the large n limit. You can use this kind of generalization and then uh, keep track of, you know, when, when you do uh, the expansion that I'm going to introduce next, keep, you know, use one over the number of flavors as your small parameter, as your perturbative parameter. Okay, but if you want to go beyond the saddle point level, right, or the mean field level, it is better to use a path integral approach. Instead of using the Hamiltonian approach, it is better to write now uh, write down the action. So we need to 
write down the, the, the Lagrangian of the theory, we have the time dependent term, plus the Hamiltonian, plus now we will introduce sources, right? These sources are basically um, fields that couple to uh, S of, you know, to, to, to uh, uh, the spin as a function of space and time, right? So that's the reason why we have space and time, imaginary time indices here. And, and we need to introduce these, these sources in the path integral formulation because, you know, we will need them to compute response functions. We want to compute the susceptibility here, so we need to take a second derivative as a function of these sources, right, in order to compute the susceptibility in these form. Another important thing, so these sources appear here, is that I'm introducing here something that you will see in a moment that is very important, which is this symmetry breaking field, right? Um, the reason why we need to introduce, so a symmetry breaking field is simply a field that couples to the 120 degree ordering, so favors, you know, this 120 degree ordering. And the reason why you need to do this is because, as I said, in this formalism, in the thermodynamic limit, you have spontaneous symmetry breaking. So that means you have, you know, many possible ground states, right? And if you want to describe an experiment, you want to choose the ground state that corresponds to the experiment, right? In this case, you know, the, the one that breaks the SO3 symmetry. Uh, so to do that, you know, we know from the books of statistical mechanics is that what we need to do is we have to insert a small field, right? Take the, thermodyna uh, take the thermodynamic limit in the presence of the very small field, and then take the, the field to zero. And in that way, we will be computing the susceptibility that corresponds to the correct ground state. If we don't do that, if we do take the limits in opposite order, then we will be computing the susceptibility of a singlet ground state. And of course, that will not reproduce the experiment, because we know very well that if, when you do a neutron scattering experiment, for instance, the S of Q and omega in the direction perpendicular to the plane is different from the component in the plane. For a singlet ground state, the three components will be the same, you know, while, you know, for a magnetically ordered state like this one, right, of course, this response will be different from that response. So that is the technical reason why this field has to be introduced, and you will see that, you know, this looks like a subtlety, but it's actually crucial, right, the, 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 the inclusion of this symmetry. The rest is kind of straightforward, I mean, um, you know, in the path integral approach, <coughs> instead of uh, using a mean field decomposition, what you do is you, you know, this is something very well known in this uh, quantum Monte Carlo community, you introduce a Hubbard Stratonovich decomposition to uh, convert your Hamiltonian that is quartic in the bosons, remember that each of these operators is quadratic, into a uh, Hamiltonian that is uh, only quadratic in the in the Schwinger bosons, right? <coughs> uh, so you perform this Hubbard Stratonovich transformation, right, by writing uh, now uh, these two terms of the Hamiltonian in this way. So for each of the fields A and B, we have to introduce a Hubbard Stratonovich field. So you, you know, Hubbard Stratonovich field is this W that has an A or B index, right, corresponding to these two. And then, um, uh, you know, once you do that, now uh, you can, in principle, formally integrate out uh, the bosons, right? Because the new action that you get is quadratic in the bosons, right? And what is in between, what appears in between the two bosons, <laughs> right, in this action, is the so-called, is the inverse of the propagator of this, of these bosons, right? So, in principle, now we can uh, express our partition function simply in terms of the fields uh, W, the Hubbard Stratonovich fields, and the effective action, right, simply the log of this, I mean, it has two contributions, you know, one that comes from this quadratic term that appeared, you know, in the Hubbard Stratonovich transformation, and then another component comes from integrating out these bosons, right, that is simply given by um, this expression, right, where the bosonic partition function is given by this determinant. So the important thing to notice is that, you know, you, you, you have here a Gaussian integral in terms of these bosons, so we have identified now one of the propagators, right, that is basically the propagator for this matter. Of it. 
So typically, when you know what, when you when you do this, you know you know that you know you replace one difficult problem by another difficult problem, because you know this effective action, right, is a complicated function of these uh, covered Cantonage fields. So you need to do something else if you want to be able to to do some calculation. And the same thing else is to expand this action, this bosonic action, around its saddle point in terms of this our autonomy means. So uh, that is the way in which this large N expansion appears. I will explain that in a moment. But something that I want to also mention before uh, I continue is that uh, by using this kind of Schoenberg boson representation and this our tectonic fields, we have converted, we have promoted our original uh, theory into a U1, U1 gauge theory, simply because you know when we introduced these bosons, right, we enlarged somehow the physical space. Right? Remember that I said that there is a constraint that tells us that you know there should be one boson per side. And uh, because of that constraint, you know, that means that you know each B appears with a V dagger. Right? Meaning that uh, the spin operators, and therefore the Hamiltonian, are invariant under this transformation, this local transformation, where you take each bosonic operator and you multiply by a phase that depends on space and time. And you know, uh, correspondingly, because these power statonic fields are conjugate to bilinear forms in these bosons, you multiply these fields by a corresponding phase that you know, depends on whether plus or minus depends on whether we are referring to A and or A or B. And the action remains invariant under this transformation. Right? So that is uh, you know, basically the gauge invariance that is typically you know, uh, described uh, in, in this kind of formalism. And what you can see here is that the gauge fields are the phases of these cover tritonic fields. And uh, basically, the Lagrange multiplier. Can I ask a question? Yes. Sure. Why, why this form, uh, this boson, uh, do not condense in, in your formalism? You didn't consider the boson condensation. I, I will condense. consider the boson condensation in a moment. No, you just uh, forget, uh, neglect this uh, possibility, is that right? No, no, no. You, you will see. I, I'm not neglecting that possibility. Bosons can condense. Okay. Yes. So you and you will see that at the other point in which they condense. So so for the moment I'm just pointing out the symmetry of you know this effective action written in terms of the bosonic field and the Howard Tetrarch fields. So this is the reason. So in some sense, you know, what we have now <coughs> is a matter field that is coupled to, to gauge fields. And we need to keep that in mind. Because you know this gauge symmetry will lead to unphysical modes, so zero modes that somehow have to removed, have to be removed, you know, from the theory, uh, you know, along the process. So, um, so now, you know, I said that you know the way you can attack this kind of problem is by expanding the action, right? And uh, you expand the action around the saddle point. So that means you know we find uh, the extreme of the action as a function of these Howard Tetonovich fields. And then uh, we expand uh, the action in powers of these Howard Tetonovich fields. So there is no linear term because, you know, by definition, you know, we are expanding around the saddle point. And now the, the, the lowest non-trivial order is this quadratic action, right? That, you know, can still be, uh, you know, once you have a quadratic action, you have a Gaussian action, you know, you can still uh, somehow integrate, you know, these fluctuations up to the quadratic level. And then beyond the quadratic level, you will have contributions to the action that you know uh, will basically have to be treated perturbatively because you know we don't know how to perform this integral when we have something that goes beyond the Gaussian level. So in this expression, now what you can see is that the partition function has been <coughs> expressed as a product of a contribution that comes you know from the saddle point action times this Gaussian integral, but you know that in principle contains these corrections that come from the uh, expansion beyond the, the quadratic level. And these are uh, basically the fluctuations of the Howard Statonovich fields relative to the, to the saddle point line. So this is the program that we will follow. First, you know, we will see what do we get at the saddle point level. Right? That is essentially the mean field approximation when you are working at the Hamiltonian level. 
And then we will see how these corrections to the action basically modify the result. And what will be surprising is that uh, the, 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 the change that appears you know, in the next order is, is a qualitative change relative to the, the side of the side. So we will see that you know, it is crucial, actually, to introduce the interactions. Right? I will explain by the end of the lecture why it is crucial in order to have a good description of these uh, magnum modes and you know, in, in general of the dynamical spin structure factor. So, um, okay. So, first of all, um, I said that uh, defective action basically is determined by this uh, Green's function, right, of the bosonic fields that now is a function of uh, the Havard Stratonovich fields uh, lambda, the Lagrange multiplier, and the external sources that I introduced basically to compute correlation functions. So how that looks like, right? Well, in general, you know, uh, first of all, before explaining how it looks like, let me say that it is convenient to move to a local reference frame where this 120 degree ordering looks like a ferromagnetic ordering. So you can always choose the local reference frame on the three sub lattices in such a way that the x-axis is along the field direction, the, the, I mean this is 120 degree ordering direction. So now remember this is a symmetry breaking field. In this twisted reference frame, it will be just a uniform field along the x direction. And the way you perform that transformation is by shifting these bosons in momentum space by half of the ordering wave vector. Capital Q is in general the ordering wave vector. By half of the ordering wave vector, or plus half of the ordering wave vector for spin up, a minus half of the ordering wave vector for spin. That's the only, I mean, that, that, that is the, 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 you know, uh, the, the, the momentum space version of this transformation. And then you can write down your, uh, the inverse uh, of your Green's function, which is, you know, which looks like the typical four by four matrix. Uh, and here is more four by four because there are two flavors, up and down, and because you have anomalous terms that you will write if you were right doing you know, a mean field approximation, right? Or when you do typical you know, spin wave theory, I mean, you get a matrix like this one, a dynamical matrix. Once again, uh, you know, because you have anomalous terms and because <coughs> here you have the flavor up and down. The difference is that you know, when you are doing a mean field calculation, the Howard Statonage fields are frozen in a translational invariant value, right? It's what will be called the saddle, saddle point approximation here. But at this level, the Howard Statonage fields, you know, can be, can have any, any value, right, at every single side. So your Green's function in general is not diagonal in momentum space or in frequency space, right? So now you have a 4 by 4 matrix with, where each matrix element is some convolution, right? simply because it corresponds to the propagator of these bosons, free bosons, right, in a Havard Stratonovich field that you know, can have arbitrary fluctuations. Right? So, so essentially this uh, Green's function, the inverse of the Green's function is a four by four matrix similar to the one that you typically diagonalize when you, the dynamical matrix that you have when you solve a mean field problem, but the difference once again is that at the saddle point, it's only at the saddle point level that you know, this Havard Tetronovich field will be translational invariant, for instance, and then you know, this will become diagonal, right? So, uh, and indeed, you know, uh, if, if, you, if, if you compute you know, uh, this matrix, at the, I mean, the, at the saddle point level, I mean, like, you know, if you compute the action at the saddle point level, what you have to do is you have to find the, the extreme of the action, right? Take, in, take the derivative of the effective action as a function of the Havard Tetronovich fields, and you will have uh, two terms in the derivative, one coming from the quadratic form in the, uh, in the Havard Tetronovich fields that you, know, you have when you introduce the Havard Tetronovich transformation, and another component that appears, you know, you, you have the exponential of g to the minus one in the action, you take the derivative, uh, basically, uh, of this exponential, and you get this trace of g times the derivative of g times g to the minus one, right? So this defines, you know, the saddle point equations, <laughs> right? And at this point is that uh, you need to provide some ansatz for, you know, the values of these Havard-Tetonovich fields that are defined on bonds of your system, right? 
So uh, what you can see is that the 120 degree ordering corresponds to values like this one where A and B are real numbers, right? And you end up, you know, this, this equation becomes a self-consistent equation. Now you have A, B, and the Lagrange multiplier, right? Where A and B appear on the left-hand side of the equal sign, and they are, they are also appearing, you know, in these in this gamma curves, right? So this is the kind of self-consistent equation that you solve also when you do a mean field calculation at the Schwinger boson level. And it's in this way uh, that you recover, if you want, the mean field approach, you know, with a path integral approach. It's the saddle point level of your theory that gives you, uh, you know, the mean field approximation. So uh, once you solve self-consistently these, these equations, now you will have, as I said, a translational invariant value of the Howard Stratonovich fields. So now your Green's function, this 4 by 4, the, 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 the dynamical matrix, will become diagonal in momentum and frequency, right? Because your Howard Stratonovich fields are invariant and their translations in time and space. So, uh, so now you can write, you know, this. Uh, propagator as a 4 by 4 matrix, right? That is indeed diagonal in frequency and momentum at the saddle point, right? Saddle point, indicates, you know, this, this Green's function is evaluated at the saddle point. And going to your question, so when you plot this, the dispersion of these uh, bosonic modes, which are the spin-ons of the theory, you see that, you know, you have this kind of gapless Goldstone, I mean, kind of linear modes that are gapless, and that uh, typically in this kind of theories comes with a condensation, right? So you have the Bogoliubo coefficients, you know, are diverging at these points, meaning that when you write down this Green's function, there are two contributions. One that we will call the normal contribution is the propagator of the spin-ons that are not, not condensed, you know, they have a wave vector different from the gamma point or from the ordering wave vector, that is k, the k point or minus the k point. So this part uh, is the non-condensed contribution, and this, there is another contribution that scales like the number of sides, right? And that corresponds to the contribution from the condensed. Right? This is telling you that at the mean field level, you have a macroscopic occupation of the ground state, right, with bosons with spin-ons that, you know, can have momentum in, in this twisted reference frame, momentum uh, zero or k and minus, right? So, so at the mean field level, we have a condensed gas of three bosons, right? This is essentially the way this kind of theory can describe the magnetic order. The, the magnetic order parameter will be determined by this condensate fraction. This is the value, the amplitude of the magnetic order parameter Stagger magnetization will be determined by this, this part. Okay, so, but here is where, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, inserting this symmetry breaking field becomes important. Because uh, the problem that we have here, not the problem, but the, the reality, is that as you can see, you have uh, four gapless modes, right? One here, two here, and one here for the spin. And actually, as I will discuss later in the lecture, the velocity is exactly the same for the four of them. There is only one spin-on velocity. Right. And I'm saying that the bosons are condensing at this point, so these are the points where you have gapless modes. But you know, there are many ways of condensing bosons when you have four gapless modes, modes right? When you have uh, you know, these four single particle states that are you know, have zero energy, right? Because the spin can be up or down, and again, you can condense at k or minus k. So, that freedom, right, is reflecting the fact that, you know, your ground state has a continuous degeneracy, as we know, right? I mean, this, if we have this magnetic ordering, right, uh, this 120 degree de magnetic ordering, we can choose, you know, this magnetic ordering to be, uh, you know, a, in any plane. Right? So actually, we have the order parameter for non-collinear ordering, as we will discuss later, the target manifold is SO3, right? So actually, the order parameter of a non-collinear magnet is 
is a rotation matrix. Right? So we have a continuum of ground states. And if we want to choose the ground state that corresponds to the 120 degree ordering, I mean to the particular 120 degree ordering that I was choosing there, well, then what we have to do is we have to insert the symmetry breaking field and perform the limit first, you know, when the first the thermodynamic limit and then the limit when the field goes to zero. So this will guarantee that, you know, we are working with the correct ground state. If we do the opposite, if we send the limit first to zero and then we take the thermodynamic limit, we will end up with a singlet ground state. And then we will have the problem that I mentioned before, that we will be computing the wrong uh, susceptibility because you know, we will get a susceptibility that is the same in the three directions when we know very well that for an ordered magnet we should have you know, transverse and longitudinal modes and things like that. So the susceptibility should be an isotope. Okay, so the effect of the field, as you can see, is to introduce a small gap in uh, basically uh, at, at plus and minus k, this mode becomes gapped, and then uh, one of these two modes becomes gapped. You may be wondering why this field is not gapping all the modes. I mean, that is what the intuition will tell us, right? If we were thinking of you know, a semi-classical approach, you put a symmetry breaking field that couples linearly to the order parameter, you should gap out all the modes. The reason why one mode still remains gapless, right? You can see it here, is because this is the spurious mode that has to do with the fact that, uh, you know, it's the density mode, right? So remember that the density here is fixed, right? But, you know, uh, we, we have to fix it with a constraint. So in principle, in this theory, we still have this kind of charge or density mode that is unphysical, and, you know, is the mode that will be will disappear you know, through the Higgs mechanism you know, when we couple these pinons to the gauge field. Right? So this, this is a kind of a physical mode that is still the stuff. Okay, so uh, if you really, I mean, perform these limits in the two different orders, you can convince yourself that indeed the, the condensed part of the Green's function, this part that scales like the number of bosons, is different, you know, when you take the, when you when you do the limit in this way, you have contributions at k equals zero, the ordering wave vector or minus the ordering wave vector. When you take the limit in the um, uh, in the uh, correct order, right? So you first take the thermodynamic limit and then you take the limit of h going to zero. You only get a contribution at the gamma, point, right? Which is related to what I was explaining here. There is only one gapless point at the gamma point, so. Uh, so basically, you are, what you are doing with that limiting procedure is, you know, choosing the correct ground state. Okay, so now we are ready for the perturbative one over n expansion, right? Uh, as I mentioned along the process, you know, there are two types of propagators in this theory. One is the propagator of the matter field, which are the spinons, right? It's essentially this Green's function evaluated at the southern point. And then uh, there is another propagator associated with the quadratic term in the expansion of the action, so the inverse of the fluctuation matrix, right, is the so-called RPA propagator, right, and we can represent it in this way, we'll explain in a moment why, but uh, essentially it is simply the inverse of this fluctuation matrix that appears, right, in the expansion of the action at quadratic level. And then there are two types of vertices, right, uh, there are vertices that come that correspond to uh, derivatives, you know, that we have to take as function of the external sources, right, that, you know, we need for computing the susceptibility, so derivatives of the inverse of the green function, that is the dynamical matrix at the southern point level. And then uh, you have also uh, internal vertices that correspond to derivatives of the, the same uh, dynamical matrix at the southern point level as a function of the Hubbard total matrix, right? So these are the basic four elements that you need for performing the, perturb you know, the perturbative expansion in a diagrammatic way. So in this kind of uh, diagrammatic expansion, the higher order terms right, in the expansion of the action, uh, they correspond to loops like this. So basically, as I said, at the RPA level, you have uh, you know, the relevant diagrams. You, know, you have two vertices, two internal vertices, and then two propagators, right? Uh, you know, 
the higher order contributions of the action will have, you know, the third order will have three internal vertices and one loop, fourth order, four internal vertices and one loop, and so on and so forth. So these objects, you know, will also appear in, in the diagrams in principle, so I, I mentioned that. Okay, so now let's go to the point, you know, we want to compute this particular correlation part, right? We want to compute the susceptibility, right? Um, and for that, we have to take the derivative, the second derivative of the, the logarithm, <coughs> logarithm of the partition function as a function of you know, the external sources, right? And when we do that, uh, we will get two contributions. One, if you want that comes, you know, you have to take a second derivative, so one that comes from, you know, taking the second derivative of the action, right? You know, each derivative will bring a Green's function and an, intern, an, an, an external vertex, right? Uh, so we have G, U, G, U, right? And, and there is another term when you take the second derivative that is the product of two derivatives of the action. So now we have a G, U trace. This trace is over the space, time, and flavor indices, and times another derivative, so, uh, that you know will bring another trace of g times. So this is the disconnected part of the susceptibility. Is, you know that corresponds to the expectation value of s times expectation value of s. This is the connected part that corresponds to the expectation value of the product of two spin operators. Right. So these are the two contributions. We will call them one and two. Right. And basically, at the saddle point level, uh, this right uh, becomes a constant. Right. That's independent. On, I mean, it has to be evaluated that you know the saddle point values of, of the Hubbard Stratonovich fields. So this integral disappears, and basically what we get at the saddle point level is simply the trace again of the product of these four matrices. <coughs> where we have you know two Green's functions and two external vertices, right? And this diagrammatically can be represented in this way. So this dashed line corresponds to each external source, right? So we have a second derivative, so we have two external sources. And, and basically, these are the external vertices, and these are the two propagators. So, you know, these are the external vertices, u and u here, one propagator here, and another propagator coming from. So this bubble, uh, what it represents is we create a spin excitation in the system. It decays into two spinons. The two spinons reconnect, and then the excitation comes out. Right, as a spin excitation again. So this is the connected part, right? But there is also a disconnected part. Okay, that looks like this. You know, diagrammatically, it's the product of these two traces. Of course, this contribution is zero, right? Because the expectation value of S of Q and omega, right, for our uh, ground state, even for the magnetically ordered state, is zero. So the only non-zero contribution that we have at the saddle point level comes from here, right? And this is what is already telling us that at the saddle point level we will not get something that is physically very correct. Because it is telling us that, you know, if I introduce a, a spin excitation in this system, it will decay into two spinons, into two free spinons, essentially. One can be in the condensate, you know, that's a, an important detail, but, you know, essentially it will decay into two free spinons. And we know that that is not correct because the spinner should be confined, right, in the magnetic orders. But of course, that confinement will not appear at the mean field level. So uh, you have this kind of diagram at the saddle point level. So essentially, one magnetic excitation decaying into two spinners. And if you go beyond the saddle point level, now what you have to do is you have to correct this in these formulas, right? You need to correct these Green's functions. Right, these two Green's functions. Um, I will do it, you know, I will not derive all the one over n corrections, I will derive the relevant one, and you know, then I will show the other ones. But you know, keep in mind that here, you know, we can expand these green, two Green's functions around the southern point. So uh, if we expand the Green's function around the southern point, one can see that you, know, you get a correction like that one. So now you get, in the correction term, you get uh, something that diagrammatically will be one propagator, one uh, internal vertex, and then another propagator. So it's like inserting, a, taking a derivative is like inserting uh, 
uh, uh, an internal vertex in the line, right? So, so what happens now is that you know, remember the disconnected diagram. Now, uh, you know, we are inserting one internal vertex in this loop, another internal vertex in this loop, and now we have the Gaussian integral, right? Because you know, we are expanding, you know, now in the Howard Tonovich fields. So we have a Gaussian integral of the product of these two fields, and that will give us an RPA propagator. Right? So now that diagram that was not giving any contribution at the math so at the point level, that second part of the susceptibility story now uh, gives this diagram that, as I will argue in a moment, indeed gives a finite 1 over n correction to the magnetic susceptibility. So this is just an example of how one of these corrections appears. There are three other diagrams that appear to order 1 over n. The order of a diagram essentially is given by the number of RPA propagators and a number of internal loops that come from the correction of the action. So in particular, each RPA propagator brings a 1 over n factor. Each internal loop brings an n factor. So for instance, here we have only one RPA propagator and no internal loops. So this is 1 over n. One RPA propagator, no internal loops, 1 over n one RPA propagator and no internal loops, one over n, and then um, two RPA propagators and one internal loop. So it's also order one of them. This is the only diagram that contains a contribution beyond the Gaussian level in the expansion of the action. Right? Um, and you know, notice that these two diagrams, uh, this and this one, essentially what they comprise is an effective renormalization of the single magnet line. Right? Similar, similar, not the same as you know, what you do when you do country, country four. So you are renormalizing the single spin on dispersion, the single spin on propagator, sorry. And this one is a kind of vertex renormalization, right? So you are basically renormalizing the vertex. So in the rest of the talk, I will focus on this correction for reasons that will become clear by the end of, of the lecture. Um, so, uh, but you know, it is important to keep in mind that you know there are three additional one over n corrections you know, to, the, to the susceptibility. So, um, good. So now, let's analyze this diagram. That is the one that I will be considering. Uh, so, what we need to do, as I said, is we have to take the limit, the thermodynamic limit in presence of the symmetry breaking field, and then send the symmetry breaking field to zero. And here is where the symmetry breaking field plays a crucial role because what one can see here is that this diagram contains this kind of loop, right? Remember the loop when you have two external vertices is simply the susceptibility at the saddle point level, right? That's what I mentioned before. When you have an open circle here is the second derivative of the action as a function of J1 and J2. So it will be the susceptibility at the mean field level. Similarly, when you have an internal vertex here, this is a susceptibility where what you have now is the product of a um, spin field that is a vector field, it transforms like a vector, uh, you know, under SU2, and a Havard Tatonovich field. But remember, the Havard Tatonovich fields here are singlets, right? That is, you know, this characteristic property of the Schwinger Boson theories. These are singlets. So that means that we are computing a cross susceptibility between a vector field and a singlet field. If my ground state, right, the ground state that I'm using for computing the susceptibility is a singlet, I get zero, correct? So indeed, this loop, right, and therefore the whole diagram, is exactly <coughs> zero if you naively compute this for the singlet ground state. And this, I think, is the reason why this was not noticed. What I'm describing today was not noticed before. Because before, indeed, it was reported, you know, it appears in a paper by Arobas and Auerbach, that this loop is zero. Right? So it seems like you know, it's disappointing that the, the next 1 over n correction is zero. So you cannot, I mean, you need to go to 1 over n squared, perhaps, you know, to, to fix these things. But actually, you know, once you include the symmetry breaking field, now the ground state breaks the symmetry, the SU2 symmetry, and this loop can be non-zero. And indeed it is non-zero, right? So, so that is a crucial point, right? That makes, a, you know, that tells us that, you know, when you take the limits in the correct order, this diagram doesn't vanish, 
Uh, the other important thing is that you may be wondering, well, what about the gauge, the zero gauge modes? Uh, basically, the, this RPA propagator we have, or the, the dynamical matrix, to be more precise, we have zero modes. We have one zero mode for each Q and omega, and that is because of the gauge invariance of the theory. Those zero modes are unphysical modes, right? They have to do with the fact that you know we are using a redundant description of our physical problem. And actually, what one can demonstrate immediately is that uh, because the action, so this is the, the theta you know, that appear in the gauge transformation, because the action is invariant under this gauge transformation, so I can write the derivative of the action as a function of the parameter of my gauge transformation using the chain rule. I can write this equation. And now I can take another derivative as a function of the sources and immediately get that at the saddle point, at the saddle point this term is zero by definition of the saddle point action, and then I get that basically this loop that I was describing here, the second derivative is, is this loop, uh, <coughs> acting on my gauge, your zero gauge modes is exactly zero. So that is telling you that these zero gauge modes that appear, that are poles of the RPA propagator, right? will not contribute to this diagram because they don't couple to this. So they, are, they belong to the kernel of, of this group. Anyway, so those are details, technical details. When you add this diagram, right, you finally do the calculation and you add the diagram, indeed you find that you know, there is a qualitative improvement of the result going from uh, the saddle point to this saddle point plus one over n correction. So in other words, as one would expect, adding the interaction between spinons mediated by the gauge fields does modify the dynamical response in a qualitative fashion. So these are the three components. Z is the axis perpendicular to the plane, and these are X and Y components, you know, the sum of the two. This is the sum of the three of them. But what I want you to, you to see is, first of all, that uh, in the saddle point result, you have these kind of modes that are unphysical, right? These are spurious modes. I mean, one can tell that they are spurious modes because if you take, if you compute the density-density correlation, that should be zero. The dynamical structure factor for the density should be zero because the density is fixed in this theory. You get you know, very large intensity in these modes. So the first problem of this theory at the saddle point level is that you are getting something that looks like magnons. The reason why you get something that looks like magnons is because you can put one speed on, you know, Creating a magnon is essentially creating two spinons. If you create one spinon in the condensate, right, the other spinon will have, so condensate means k equal to zero, the other spinon will have the wave vector of the magnon. Right? So you will, at the bottom of the two spinon continuum, you will have a delta-like contribution right, that you could in principle identify with the magnons of your theory. But the problem is that these magnons, if they are magnons, you know, they include these kind of spurious modes, and not only that, the velocity, right, of, of this kind of Wollstone modes between modes is the spin-on velocity, right? And that cannot be right because, I will explain that in a moment in a, uh, you know, um, in, in, a, in, in, in more detail, but we know that, you know, we have three Wollstone modes in the theory, two with, with one velocity and one with a different velocity, and here there is one velocity for all of them, of all of them. The interesting thing is when you add the one over n correction that I was describing here, these poles are exactly cancelled, right? And instead you have new poles that come from the RPA propagator. And that one can see uh, in a cut, if you do a, if you plot this uh, intensity as a function of frequency for a particular wave vector, uh, these dashed lines correspond to the saddle point result. Uh, the blue lines correspond to the one over n correction that I was discussing here, and basically you can see that there is an exact cancellation of the saddle point poles, and now there is a new pole that is appearing here. So that new, that new pole is a pole of the RPA propagator, right? Um, and actually this cancellation comes from, from these loops, right? So in this diagram, the poles of the RPA propagator are also poles of the diagram. And the cancellation of the poles that we had at the saddle point level actually come from these parts of the diagram.
So uh, this is kind of remarkable, right? Now uh, we are getting completely different, you know, picture for you know what are the magnons of the theory. They have nothing to do with the poles that you know appear at the southern point level. They are poles of the RPA propagator as they must be, right? Those are the real collective modes of the system. And now we are ready to compare, for instance, the velocity of these new magnons, right? You know, now we have a magnon dispersion, right? And you know we have also modes which have different velocity indeed at the k points and at the gamma points. So we can compare these velocities against linear, you know, non-linear actually spin wave theory. Linear spin wave theory actually works very well in the long wavelength limit. So you expect that the velocities should be correctly described by linear or non-linear spin wave theory. Actually, the correction is small from the from the one over s correction. And indeed, you know, you get very close velocities. Right? So now the velocities of the magnons that you obtain from this one over n correction are very similar to the velocities that are obtained from uh, the hydrodynamic limit of the theory when you do the one over s expansion. The other aspect is you can compare the ordered moment, right? The full moment is 0 0.5. Uh, if you compare the ordered moment with nonlinear spin wave theory, you get 0 0.25. Numerical results, variational QFC, DMRC, and series expansions give these values when you uh, basically, add this one over n correction. You use, I'm not going to describe this procedure, you need to use the Fadir Popov procedure to remove the zero modes of the theory. You get 0 0.22. So, somehow you get a number that seems to be closer to, to the numerical values. Uh, this is a comparison with serious expansions. It shows that, uh, well, there is a reasonably good agreement in the regions where the magnets have large spectral weight in the high energy high-energy region, there is still some disagreement, so this is not the end of the story by any means. Um, so, uh, and, and basically, uh, what, I mean, what, what this is saying is that, okay, so this is maybe just a starting point, you know, we got the magnons, you know, the maybe higher order corrections that, you know, need to be included in order to explain you know, this kind of decrepance. Uh, and as I said, you know, this theory, Basically, this real material is a three-dimensional material, so if you want to describe things in three dimensions, um, you basically need to add the inter interlayer coupling. So you can do that you know, within this theory. And then uh, what we get for the single magnum bandwidth is 1.3 milli electron volts, which is lower now than experimental value, instead of significantly higher than this, what we were getting with the nonlinear, with the large S expansion. So again, this is an indication that you know we are still not getting the experimental single magnet dispersion. But perhaps you know what is promising is that when you look at the energy cut, for instance, at these end points, you have a large intensity um, of you know for the magnum peaks, but then you have a much larger intensity, right, for the two magnum continuum. So this is indeed the experiment of Professor Tanaka, right, that shows at the end point. This is the spectral density of the magnons. And here, you can see that there is this very large uh, intensity in the continuum, which is really what triggered uh, you know, our interest in this material. And once again, I remind you that if this is what you get with a large S approach. Right? So at this point, uh, so OK, so I can, OK, so, so basically, I would say based on this result, I'm not saying by any means that this is the end of the story, I would say this is just a good beginning of the story because somehow one can explain now with this, by, by adding the interaction between the spinons, one can somehow explain, you know, the intensity of this high energy continuum and simultaneously they appear, you know, the, 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 the emergence of these magnons that, as I said, appear in the theory as, as poles of the RPA propagators. So you really need to go beyond the, the saddle point approximation to get the correct magnets. So, okay, so this is enough, you know, with the comparison with experiment. So I would like to discuss only a final thing, which, you know, is very nicely illustrated by this picture. I don't know if you, if you, if you open this book, the book by Arobas, by, by uh, Asa Auerbach, uh, you know, uh, very well known in our community, this book, Interacting Electrons and Quantum Magnetism. Uh, you know, he has very nice drawings, and you know, one of them is, is this one. Uh, 
right, where, you know, he's looking at these signs, you know, large S, large N, and, and uh, you know, it is, I mean, at least from the picture, it's clear that these two paths are connecting, right, somewhere, but, you know, the question that you may ask is, okay, what do you need to connect these two, you know, how do you connect these two paths, right, what is needed, how do you find, how do you recover the large S limit if you are using a large N approach, right, so where is this point, you know, it seems to be close to the sun, close to the sun. So what I want to show you in the remaining slides is that um, when you add this one over n correction and you take the largest limit, right, you recover exactly the linear spin wave theory in the largest limit, which is, you know, a condition. I mean, there are very few things that we know for sure here. One of them is that in the largest limit, we, we should recover the linear spin wave result. So that is a good sanity check. And, um, and let me explain in, in, in a couple of slides uh, why we know for sure that that will not work if we stop at the saddle point level, right? So, and for that, I need to remind you, right, uh, of what I said uh, a few minutes ago, that when you have a non-collinear ordering, right, your order parameter is basically your target manifold is SO3 because you are breaking the groups completely. So, essentially, your order parameter is a rotation matrix, Right, that you need to define the orientation of the order parameter, and and you can think then of you know a triad E1, E2, E3, right? That is your reference, right, for that rotation matrix, <coughs> right? So each possible value of the order parameter will be a rotation of this triad. Right? And in the in the long wavelength limit, you can write, I mean, uh, you know, an effective theory, right, for this type of magnetic ordering expanding around. Uh, this uniform state and taking the long, only keeping the long wavelength fluctuations. And what you will get is, as always, an effective uh, nonlinear sigma model, but for this order parameter that is an SO3 matrix. Right? And, and of course, this, this, this action, I mean, sorry, this effective theory will have three Goldstone modes because we are breaking spontaneously three uh, continuous symmetries. And as I said before, we have one with one velocity and a doublet of Holston modes with a different velocity, right? So this is the low energy spectrum of this thing. Good. So now, imagine that for a moment that this velocity becomes the same as this velocity, right? So now we have a triplet, a degenerate triplet of Holston modes, right? And whenever we have a degenerate triplet of Holston modes, you have an additional symmetry in the theory. It's another SU2. In high energy, it is called isospin. Actually, there is this nonlinear sigma model appears in nuclear physics as a principal chiral model, and uh, and there it appears with a symmetry that is SU2 cross SU2. So you have a triplet of Holston modes. And the second SU2 is the so-called isospin SU2 that has to do with, rot I mean, if I rotate this reference frame, I mean, this, this Re, you know, the, the, the reference, these three axes that I'm using as the reference for the rotation matrix, if I choose, for instance, another set of three axes, right? So, for instance, I could choose E1 to be perpendicular to my 120 degree ordering or to be pointing um, along the in plane direction, right? So, I could choose those two references and write, you know, my, my effective theory using these two different references. If this SU2 symmetry is present, you know, the theory will be invariant under my choice of these three axes. When, when the, when the SU, SU2 isospin is not present, you know, I will get a different form of the theory. So, so the bottom line is, when you have a, a triplet of Holston modes, there is an additional SU2 the symmetry in the theory. So SU2 cross SU2 is, is, is of So you have more symmetry. Now, let's think for a moment of what is the, 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 the kind of encryption that, you know, we get when we are using these uh, spin-ons, right, this uh, uh, kind of, uh, we, we are trying to describe this magnetic ordering at the saddle point level with a gas of non-interacting spin-ons. So, uh, in that case, uh, what happens in the original reference frame, that I think is clearer than you know, this twisted reference frame, as I explained before, you have four spin-on modes, one for spin-up, one for spin-down, and then one at minus k over two and one at plus k over two, this is the ordering wave vector. But the point is, because the original Hamiltonian has inversion symmetry and because it also has SU2 symmetry, you can show, show immediately that this 
four modes have exactly the same spin on velocity. So there is only one spin on velocity in the theory. So when you write you know, your uh, effective action in terms of these variables, right? I mean, this will be like the long wavelength limit of the saddle point uh, action that I would describe in the previous slides. There is only one velocity. So if I compare with what I said here, that means that this theory, right, that will give us the Goldstone modes, you know, with momentum zero as, you know, creation of two triplets, uh, two, two spin-ons, right, the spin-ons ca carry spin, so, you know, with two spin and half spin-ons, you know, we have a triplet of magnetic modes, and then we have a singlet that is an amphysical mode, it's a density. So that's the way we get the three magnetic excitations, but they will have, the three of them will have the same velocity. So in other words, at the saddle point level, my effective field theory has more symmetry than the original Hamiltonian. That's an O4 symmetry instead of uh, the correct SU2 symmetry that you know, we should have. And that is the reason why you know, uh, we know that you know, when, when we are basically describing the critical, you know, when, when we go from the magnetically ordered state through the critical point to the spin liquid phase, you know, what happens at the critical point is that the interaction terms become irrelevant, right? So the free spin-on theory becomes the exact theory, the fixed point, right? This, this action becomes the fixed point only at the critical point. Of course, if, you, if we are inside, you know, on the order of the side, we have interaction terms that must be added to this action and they are not irrelevant. Those interaction terms, of course, break this O4 symmetry, as I showed before, right? You know, we got Goldstone modes with different velocities. But when the interaction terms, you know, right at the critical point, interaction terms become irrelevant, and there is an emergent O4. So that is the emergent O4 that was found in 1994 by Andrei Chubukov, uh, Subir Sachsev, and, and Sentin, right? So that's the reason why that critical point has an O4 symmetry. It's the same reason why, you know, at the saddle point level, we, there is no way we can get the correct velocities of the Goldstone mode. So, um, good. So, I, in the previous slides I described, you know, how to add, you know, basically the effect of adding this diagram. What I want to mention now is, you know, what does it mean in terms of a large S expansion? In terms of a large S expansion, we can see how we can compute, I will not derive this here, but, you know, I will state it. You know, how these different contributions, you know, the, the propagator of the spinons, the RPA propagator and the vertices, and the sum over frequency scale as a function of s. And what one can see is that you know the normal part of the propagator scales like one over s, but the condensed part of the spin-on propagator scales like s to the zero. The internal and the external vertices scales like s to the zero. The RPA propagator scales like s to the zero. And each loop, its sum over frequencies brings a factor of s. So uh, that means that when we are adding these two diagrams in the largest limit. We can simply replace, you know, one of the two propagators in the loop by basically the condensed, only the condensed part of the propagator. So that is what I mean by this double line, right? And indeed, when, when you do that, so by to take the, the largest limit, at the saddle point level, what you see in the largest limit, this is a comparison between linear spin wave theory, that is the dashed line, the intensity reflects, you know, the spectral wave and what you get at the saddle point level. So at the saddle point level, you have two problems. One is that the velocity of the Goldstone modes is the same for all of them. The other problem that you get uh, is that you, know, you have these Fourier modes that become gapless in the largest limit. So you have these quadratic gapless modes that are also incorrect. But as soon as you add this one over n correction, right, with the dominant, I mean, after taking the largest limit with the condensed propagator for one of the two lines, now you get an exact agreement with linear spin wave theory, right? So you go from this kind of agreement to this agreement. This is a comparison of the single magnet dispersion in the, from the linear spin wave theory from, with what, what, what we get after adding, adding this correction. This is the intensity, right? The comparison of the spectral weight, right? For different values of the wave vectors. So you can see that there is a very good agreement. Uh, if you are asking, you know, how to include single magnon into two magnon decay in this kind of theories, it will appear through diagrams of this nature. The RPA propagator is essentially your magnon propagator in this kind of theory. So, you know, uh, here is how a single magnon can decay into two magnons 
and then recombine again. So this will be the counterpart of you know what the diagram that I show for the one hour correction, right, in the semi-classical approach, in this kind of approach. So to answer the question to, you know, so basically the place where these two approaches meet is, you know, uh, somehow when you go to, you know, you add this one over n correction, right, beyond this, the, the saddle point, then it is possible <coughs> to show that indeed large S can be recovered from large N. So just to, to conclude, um, let me uh, reiterate uh, that, uh, you know, the big problem that, you know, we are trying to address here is that there are many materials that are appearing that do order magnetically, but they show very anomalous excitation spectrum. So we need to do something to describe this region. And maybe we can use those materials already to show the prefractionalization, to show the symptoms of proximity to spin liquid. So you know that even if we don't find a spin liquid, it is still a very useful concept, right? Because you can describe by proximity to you know this this, this critical point, we can describe the physics of the ordered state in a more natural way using the elementary excitations of the spin liquid state. And uh, the other message is, in these large N approaches, the true magnum modes appear as poles of the RPA propagator, have nothing to do with you know, what you get at the standard point level. <coughs> and then, uh, you know, we are getting for this particular material a two spin on continuum that you know, could have something to do with this high intensity that Professor Taraka is observing in the two-minor continuum, no, sorry, in the high energy continuum of this, of this material. And uh, the other aspect is, you know, we can get correct, the correct, you know, ordered moment and, and velocities, you know, by adding this simple one over n correction. And finally, that, you know, it is possible to reproduce now the largest. So thank you very much for your attention. You mean how general it is? Yeah, how general it is. Okay, yes, so that's a good question. I mean, so it's completely general. So basically for any non-collinear ordering, here I explain everything for the 120 degree order. Okay. But for any non-collinear ordering, uh, you can you can see that this is the case. Okay. For collinear ordering, there is something, uh, you know, uh, interesting that happens that, you know, collinear ordering is different from non-collinear because you have still this U1 single uh -huh. group. So what is to, you know, for the collinear ordering, already at the saddle, I mean, um, already at the saddle point level, you get the correct dispersion. So you can recover the one over S limit already at the saddle point level, right? And this one over N correction is not that important mm -hmm. because, because of this U1 symmetry of the magnetically ordered state, the bubble, that bubble that I explained, you know, that this cancels, also cancels for the transverse mode. So somehow you don't get a correction of the transverse mode due to this. And historically, what happened is that you know people really focused first on the collinear orderings, so it was not so clear the need for going beyond the saddle point level because already at the saddle point level you get the correct dispersion in the largest limit. But you know then later on they noticed you know Coleman, Larkin. I mean they noticed that when you try to describe a non-collinear ordering with the saddle point decryption in the largest large decryption, you don't recover you know the largest. Limit. You cannot reproduce it. And you know, what we are showing is actually, you know, you need to go one order beyond the saddle point and you always, you know, regardless of you know what is the ordering you can because you know one can demonstrate analytically this cancellation. You know, what I described <coughs> here, this this cancellation of poles, you know, this thing. You know, it is possible to show that in an analytic way and you know to show that it doesn't depend on magnetic. If, if you trace out the spin on degrees of freedom from the diagrams, mm -hmm. can you construct the effective theory for magnets only? Uh, that will be very non-local. I mean, that is the problem. So yeah, but the, yeah, 
Right. Yes. I mean, schematically, yeah. theoretically. <laughs> theoretically, <laughs> yes. But you know, it's one of those things where you will have an extremely non-local action. I wonder that how that is related to the another protein moving to the higher order comes in us. In what the first time came up with that. Right. That was the answer. Right. I guess what that means in the language is that you know you will have to add diagrams of the infinite over meso. So it's like how if if the deviations are caused by, by this proximity to fractionalization, you will need to go to infinite order mm -hmm. in, the, in the one over s expansion. Mm -hmm. But you know, as always, you know, then the question is what are the diagrams that you need to sum up to infinite order in order to recover this physics. So the, the, the you know one can use magnons as a basis, I mean for I mean they are a complete basis in some sense, so, so if you add enough terms, it should be possible to, to, to describe this physics as well. The problem is how complicated it becomes. And so, I mean, the, the idea here is maybe with a, you know, with a few low-order diagrams, it is possible to reproduce the dynamical structure factor with a large N approach, while if you use a large S approach, you will have to go to the end so, uh, right. and, and that's what I'm trying to say, that you know, the theory becomes very no, no, in terms of, you know, if you do what you are, what you are asking. Yeah, another question is about the disagreement between experimental theory and the high energy. So, yes. so do you think that if you include the other three times in one well, uh, well, yeah. expansion? Right, that's what we are doing now. Right. The thing is that technically <coughs> it is more difficult to include those because you, know, you have more sums, mm -hmm. more loops. Mm -hmm. But yes, that is you know the first thing that we are doing. No, yes, fair question. Right, indeed. You know, for for I mean, what what, what we did here is is more like an exploratory research. You know, to say, well, is this program reasonable? Like you know, I mean, so and we check you know the, the first boxes, but there is still a lot of space for improvement. Uh, question. Uh, what is the could you comment on how generic this scenario is? I mean, uh, at the beginning of the, your lecture, you mentioned uh, I mean, the importance of this uh, non-collinearity of the order. But uh, can you can, can you somehow generalize this to more I mean, generic class of uh, decomfined phenomena? Ah, yeah, good point. Uh, right. So, right. So, um, yeah. Let me go back to this. Right. Uh, yeah, so, so, right, what, what I describe is, you know, a particular implementation of a large N approach. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having in mind that I'm describing a transition from this magnetically ordered state into the gapped C2 spin liquid, right? So then I know how to choose, or, you know, that is my motivation for using these finger bosons mm -hmm. that will naturally describe the transition into this kind of spin liquid. So if on this side you have a different kind of spin liquid, I don't know if you have a Dirac spin liquid, then you may have to use a different kind of pattern theory, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To to you know to basically right. you know right. get the correct description of the, the proximity to this point. So that is somehow determined by you know the phase that you have on, on this side, and you know at, at that point you have to guess. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know the the advantage is that you know when you are on this side, at least you know what is the correct saddle point. So you know that for sure on this side the system is ordering magnetically. So if you were, I mean, if if you are not using uh, the partons, let's say that you will become the free particles on this side, probably you will run in the same problem that Hiro uh, was mentioning. That you know, you may have to go to very high order in order to still recover the correct physics. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, with those partners. But you know, so somehow, you know, my choice of the Schwinger bosons is motivated by the fact that, you know, I have this spin liquid in mind, mm -hmm. right on the other side of the transition. So maybe, you know, if it is a direct spin liquid, it may be better to use fermions, mm -hmm. right, instead of bosons. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the people use the SNN uh, generalization rather than SPC work. Ah, yes, yes. And that is also related to the behavior on the other side? No, no. <laughs> that is actually related to the frustration. So when you use to when you use SUM, right, to generalize to arbitrary M, um, you need 
you know, to use uh, a given representation of SVN on one sublattice and the conjugate on the other sublattice to have singlets on each one, right? So that forces you, uh, so that can only work if you have a bipartite lattice. But when you have a non bipartite lattice like this one, then you have an issue, right? You know, you cannot assign, you know, lattices to conjugate. So then, you know, when you use SPN, there is no problem, right? So you can construct singlets on every single one. So that's the reason why, in general, you know, the, the SPN extension always works, and, you know, but, but you're absolutely right. You know, for bipartite lattices and collinear orderings, one can also use an SPN. You mentioned that the you know, linear sigma model in this uh, string of the approach have the additional asymmetric symmetry, and there is a O uh, O four asymmetry of the critical point. Yes. So does it mean that uh, if there is a phase transition from magnetic order phase to other phase, there is actually a higher symmetry? Uh, no, no, not in general. I mean, if there is a transition in, in a two, into a gapped C two spin liquid. Right? That is the kind of transition that the Schwinger bosons describe. Then what you know is that right at this point, right, your saddle point action becomes the fixed point. I mean, so basically the interaction terms that I was adding here become irrelevant, right? And as I argued, you know, here now you have only one velocity, that is the spin on velocity. So that means the three Holston modes have the same velocity. So you have a triplet of Holston modes. So in some sense, you know, you have a low energy spectrum that looks like the principal chiral model of high energy. You have like an emerging isospin. And that is the whole point of this paper. This was found, you know, years ago, right? In this paper, they predicted that, you know, if you have a continuous transition from this 120 degree ordering to a C2 gap spin liquid, which you know, is basically the universality class of this RBB state, then, you know, you should see that the three Goldstone modes become degenerate at this point. So if you are doing numerical simulations, right, that will be one indication that you are approaching this particular critical point, right? So if you follow, right, as, you know, I mean, if it is true that, for instance, you know, as a function of J2, you have a transition, a continuous transition to this kind of liquid, you know, this point should have this immersion of force. The nonlinear sigma model also can describe the phase transition? Yeah, so up to this point, right, you know, right. Uh, yeah, only at this point. But then, what? So you, you know, the, the parameters of the nonlinear sigma model will flow, right? And at this point, you know, you will have that. You know, you have this kind of new symmetry, right? So there is only one velocity in the theory instead of two. Uh, at some point, you said uh, the disorder of uh, taking the limit is important. And yes. H equals to zero, and the standard and limit. Right. And, but uh, I, I wonder, I mean, even, even for finite system, if the such system is large enough, then, I mean, the system can be, I mean, close to kind of order, semi-order state, right? So if, suppose you apply this kind of machinery to the finite system, then what? Yeah, then what you have to do is you have to apply a field that uh, is of order one over the system size. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that, that is the field at which you, you know, you see the crossover. Mm -hmm. Right from what would be the singlet ground state, and to get if you don't put any field into the magnetic field state. So the, the, the critical field for the crossover, be, you know, goes like one over it. Okay. Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. That, that I mean, there are two ways of implementing these things. One, one of them is that one. Right. You know, you can solve this in a very, very large, large system size. Mm -hmm. But in that case, right, the way you implement this field is by putting a field that is proportional to one over the system size. That is equivalent to taking the limit in the right way. So for the course, I can ask a quick question. <laughs> you are not allowed to ask. <laughs> <laughs> so can we use an uh, increase between the velocities, two velocities, as a sort of in a signature of the proximity to this uh, emotional signature yeah. of the combined? I, th I think so. I think so. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, right. That's the reason why I was emphasizing the point. Because if someone, you know, with some numerical technique, can compute these velocities, right? You know, right. The, the indication that you are approaching this kind of fixed point, I mean, right, the, the one that corresponds to the transition into this spin liquid, will be that the, the, the velocities of the two Wollstone modes should become closer and closer. I mean, there's the number of the number 
Yeah, of the magnets, right. So you will see that you know there are two, there are always like three gap, three also modes here. You know, a doublet with one velocity and an additional one with a different velocity. But again, that is not my prediction. I mean, this is was originally predicted in this paper. Right? But you know that that can be exploited, right? You know, in order to because as I said at the beginning, you know uh, there are many numerical works actually that report that when you add a J2 that is six percent of J1. Indeed, you find a critical point like this one. By the, I mean, you find a critical point with a continuous transition from 120 degree ordering into some spin liquid. Nobody knows what the spin liquid is. If it is this kind of spin liquid, then right, one would expect that these two velocities should become the same. But again, I mean, it's not easy numerically, as far as I know, right, you know to, uh, to answer this kind of question. Okay. Thank you again.